I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Sustainable Compassion for Health Professionals, Compassionate Tools for Personal and Systemic Transformation. I'm Andrea Greenberg, Communications and Partnerships Associate at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and your moderator for today's session. The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare is a national leader in the movement to make compassion a vital element in every patient-caregiver interaction. Before we begin the formal presentation, let's go over a few details about the webinar. The Schwartz Center Compassion in Action webinar series is funded in part by a donation in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. Today's program will be 60 minutes. The first 45 minutes will be presentation, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the Schwartz Center website a week after the session. Please note that attendees are participating in listen-only mode, but can interact with speakers by using the questions pane, which should be appearing on your screen. If you have questions, please just type them into the questions pane and send them to us, and we will address as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. As you exit the webinar, you will receive an electronic survey that we ask you to take a minute to complete so that we may capture your assessment of today's program. Your feedback is really important to us. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our host for today's session. Dr. Beth Lown is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Medical Director of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. Welcome, Beth. Thank you, Andrea. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for our 2016 webinar series on Compassionate Collaborative Care, or what we're calling the Triple C. Back in January, during the first webinar in this series, we introduced this Triple C model and its associated attributes and behaviors. I described some of the science of compassion and empathy and discussed why compassion is a source of reward and an antidote to burnout. The framework explains some of the key values and skills that help us offer compassionate and collaborative care to patients, families, colleagues, and coworkers, while also sustaining ourselves and our sense of happiness and meaning in work. A full description of these qualities and skills is available on our website. Each month, the Schwartz Center is offering a webinar by experts on different aspects of the Triple C, the Compassionate Collaborative Care Model and Framework. This month, we'll discuss sustainable compassion training. This is a method designed to empower people who work in all areas of care and service. Sustainable compassion training is designed to help people realize a power of unconditional care from within that's deeply healing and sustaining, that makes them more fully present to self and others, and that empowers a strong, active compassion for persons that is not subject to empathy, fatigue, and burnout. In this webinar, we'll explore methods for cultivating more sustainable care and compassion. We'll also consider systemic and organizational conditions that impede compassion and explore ways of creating the conditions necessary to support and sustain compassionate care for all. Today's program will help you to understand the importance of receiving care, self-care, and extending care to avoid empathy fatigue and burnout. Dr. Lavelle will also discuss the obstacles to compassion and care at the individual and systems level and finally provide you with tools for enhancing compassion and care in daily life and in the workplace. Today we're honored to have as our speaker Dr. Brooke Lavelle, co-founder of the Courage of Care Coalition and education consultant to the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, Dr. Lavelle. I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Dr. Long, and thank you to the Schwartz Center for hosting these important conversations. Today, as mentioned, I'd like to introduce an approach to cultivating sustainable compassion, sustainable in the sense that it is less susceptible to empathy, fatigue, and burnout. We know that burnout affects many health professionals. Burnout is also an increasing and often under-acknowledged challenge for educators, clergy, and many other caring professionals. Part of the problem is, of course, systemic. Our social service providers and caring professionals are overworked and often under-resourced. And so often, the burden of healing is placed solely on their shoulders. Yet another part of the problem, in a sense, is cultural and stems from our belief about what compassion is and how we cultivate it. Compassion is courageous, 
And as Paul Gilbert says, the courage to be compassionate lies in the willingness to see into the nature and causes of suffering, be that in ourselves, in others, and the human condition. The challenge is to acquire the wisdom we need to address the causes of suffering in ourselves and others. Compassion is one of the most important demonstrations of strength and courage known to humanity. Compassion is a stance. It's a way of being in and orienting ourselves to the world. It's a motivational stance in the sense that it organizes our thoughts, behaviors, actions, and intentions. It's not just a feeling or fleeting emotion. It involves learning and strengthening a way of being. We might even call it an ethical way of being in the world. Compassion involves two psychologies, what we call engagement and action. Engagement involves turning towards suffering, stress, and pain. And action involves learning how to skillfully respond to and reduce that suffering while also promoting love, care, and joy in the world. And because of that, because compassion is not only, on our view, about reducing suffering, but also about strengthening love and care, you might hear me use those terms, care and compassion, interchangeably throughout this webinar. There are several building blocks of compassion that need to be trained or scaffolded in order to help us abide more stably in the stance. These are attention, mindfulness, and distress tolerance, tools that help us learn to attend to and turn toward and in a sense be with difficulty. Further tools like affection, care, and empathy, the ability for us to learn to recognize the feelings, experiences of others, and to also have a loving care or concern for their feelings. So not just an intellectual idea or intellectual sense of empathy, but also to develop a natural care, concern, affection for others, not just those that we're close to. Further building blocks include wisdom and insight. We need to learn to uncover more and more the deep causes of suffering, both personal and systemic, and learn more and more to strengthen skillful ways of responding to ameliorate or reduce that suffering. And of course, all of this, as we heard, takes courage. We cultivate these skills, of course, through our own personal training, but also in the context of caring relationships. And this is critical and what I'd like to focus a little bit on. We live in a highly individualistic culture that tends to view compassion, mindfulness, and other contemplative practices as techniques through which we remake ourselves as more kind, more caring persons, more kind or more caring health professionals. This frame, as mentioned, often places the burden of transformation and healing solely on the individual's shoulder and often misses the deep relational framework that is central to many contemplative and psychological traditions. In many of these traditions, compassion is not understood to emerge simply through one's own efforts, but rather emerges in relationship to others. We learn to care for others in the same way we have been cared for. In other words, we love as we have been loved. By recognizing that the power to care for others comes not just from our own efforts, but also our experience of being cared for, we can learn to let go of the idea that we need or can do all of this alone. I'd like now to introduce Sustainable Compassion's three modes of care, what we call receiving care, deep self-care, and extending care. In each of these relational and mutually empowering modes, we have scaffolded the skills or building blocks of compassion that I previously mentioned. In what follows, I'll introduce the aim or direction of each mode and offer a simple practice or reflection that you can engage in during your day. I'll also talk about some of the obstacles, both personal and systemic, that impede our capacity for compassion. And together, we'll begin to consider how we can constructively engage and work with some of these obstacles. Many of us in social service are drawn to the professions because we have a natural deep capacity for care, a natural willingness to extend care to others, almost as if we're called in a sense to be caregivers. Yet at the same time, many of us have a difficulty in seeing or experiencing ourselves as the objects of care. 
we're much more comfortable seeing ourselves as the subjects or so-called extenders of care. Yet in order to learn to take care of others in a way that's sustainable and replenishing, we need to learn to open to more and more, to sense more and more, and actually receive sources of care in our own lives. There are many sources and moments of care that pervade our lives, many of which often go unnoticed. In large part, they go unnoticed because socially and maybe even personally, it's as if we're conditioned to notice moments of disconnection in our lives, in a sense to be on guard for ruptures in relationships, rather than to notice the many sources of care that pervade even the most mundane aspects of our lives. I'd like to invite you to think now of a simple moment of care and connection that happened recently in your life or in your workplace. This could be a simple moment in which you felt seen, welcome, accepted, basically okay. A simple moment in which someone smiled at you genuinely, maybe saw you as a human. Basically any moment in which you feel happy to recall. If it comes naturally to you, you might also think of a moment with a friend, a colleague, a partner, or a spouse, a moment in which you felt just simply basically seen, okay, welcome, at ease. We need not make a big deal out of the moment or search for the perfect moment of care. We're just simply looking for a simple moment of connection that makes us happy to recall. And take a few moments now to just settle into your body, allowing yourself to just be a little bit more comfortable in your seat, your chair. Feeling our feet on the floor, our sit bones in the chair. Feeling our hands at ease. Feeling our shoulders and the muscles of our face at ease. And together, let's take three slow, deep breaths. Now I'd like to invite you to call this caring moment to mind as vividly as possible, as if it were happening right now maybe by imagining that person's face, their eyes, their smile, their embodiment, the way in which they held or communicated care, warmth, kindness. And if you're having a difficult time right now choosing a moment of care and connection, you can also think of a place in which you feel at ease, home, welcome. And as you tune into this moment of care and connection or settle into this experience of a place in which you feel at ease, welcome, a sense of warmth or acceptance, See if you can allow yourself to open to that care that's being communicated in that moment, in that experience, in that expression. Allowing yourself to be enveloped in that care, held in that care, imprinted by those qualities qualities of care, whatever resonates with you. Allowing that care, warmth, kindness to simply pervade your body, your mind. 
to whatever extent possible right now. And when you feel ready, allowing the image of that caring moment to fade and simply relaxing into that feeling, that field of care. And when you feel ready, you can bring the practice to a close in your own way. Returning your attention just for a few moments to the feeling of your breath as it enters and leaves your body. This is a simple practice we call the caring moment practice the way of helping us learn to touch in, to notice, and to open to even small or simple moments or experiences of care in our lives. Exploring this practice regularly, even if just for a few moments a day, can help us remember many other instances of care that permeate our lives. And with repetition, we can learn to accept the deep worth potential in us that is the object of such care empowering us in turn to see others similarly in their deep worth and potential. It's by returning repeatedly to these moments of unconditional care in which we are held and deeply seen that we can begin to extend care more sustainably to others, not as an isolated individual or an isolated self trying really hard to be more kind, but someone grounded in, held in a field or even lineage of care. You might have noticed a sense of feeling slightly more at ease, slightly more at home. And it's from that space we can learn to extend care a bit more sustainably to others. And at the same time, some of us might have found that particular experiencing um, a little bit not that simple. We might have noticed some resistance maybe a subtle tightening in the body, or even a feeling of being distracted. We might have noticed thoughts like, is this really care? Or surely this person didn't really care for me. Or they must have been nice to me because they wanted something from me. Or even if they really knew me or got to know me better, they wouldn't be so kind or caring to me. These resistances and blocks that many of us experience are so common. In fact, they're so common that Paul Dilbert, who I referenced earlier, developed a series of scales to track and assess how pervasive so-called fears of compassion, fears of receiving compassion from others, fears of directing compassion to ourselves, and fears of extending compassion to others actually are. And this makes good sense. If we've ever in our lives been let down, overlooked, rejected, or haven't had all of our needs perfectly met since our day of birth, the chances are we might have some resistance to being totally open to or vulnerable to care. And as caring professionals, we're often conditioned culturally and even professionally to not, in a sense, be seen as recipients of care, to not let our guard down, to not be selfish and tend to ourselves or be taken care of by others. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Daphne of Flea. Here's an image of the flea. This is a tiny aquatic species that when placed in an aquarium with even the scent of a predator grows an armament, a full headed armament and a long scaly tail. And what's really interesting about this Daphne flea is when the threat of the predator or the scent of the predator is removed from the environment, the Daphne flea sheds the shell. It's as if we actually grow protective shells around our heart. This sounds familiar maybe to some of us in care. And what's also really important is not only do we grow these shells, and therefore part of our work in a sense is learning gently to soften and to crack those shells, 
what's really critical about this work is it's not really just only about us. Daphne of Flea's offspring actually develop shells that are significantly more robust than their peers if their mothers had previously been exposed to, to threat or predators. So in a sense, we're priming generations to come with a threat response that's even stronger if we're not learning slowly, gently, and carefully to tend to and care for our own needs for care. The next mode of sustainable compassion training is what we call deep self-care. In a sense, this mode involves really learning to feel at home in our own skin, feeling at home with our own thoughts and feelings. The more at home we feel in our own minds and bodies, the more able we are to host or enable others to feel at home in our presence. And the more familiar we become with our own inner life, our own feelings, our emotions, our own vulnerabilities, our own insecurities, our own difficult feelings, the more we are able to recognize and respond to other similar feelings. It's a way, in a sense, of building our own emotional intelligence, capacity, and empathy. The challenge, in many ways, is that it feels as if we're culturally conditioned, and also, at times, depending on our profession or our, our daily responsibilities, we're conditioned in many ways to not to feel our own feelings funny that I do this for a living and I'm confessing now that I often find myself in a moment of silence or space reaching for my iPhone to check email or text messages or Facebook the second there's a break as if I'll do anything to avoid even for a moment being with feeling. And I find this is true for others in caring professions. It feels as if we're looking for anything to fill the space that we have so that we don't have to deal or to feel. And of course this makes sense. Life is hard, work is hard, we face so many challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we do need time, in a sense, to learn to check out. But we also need to learn how to develop space to really cultivate an ability to be with what's there in a safe and a healing and a productive way. So I'm going to invite us briefly just to touch in on a practice that we call mindfulness of feelings, or sometimes compassionate presence to feelings. It's a way of learning to just simply drop in and begin to attend to whatever is present in our minds and bodies. And this is something we can do at any time, on the spot, whatever we're feeling. So once again, just sitting comfortably. And I'd like to invite you to drop into the feeling of the body. Seeing if you can feel the body from within the body. In other words, not thinking about the body, but trying to feel the body. It might help to sense the body's groundedness, feeling the feet on the floor, or becoming aware of any other physical sensations that are vivid or most salient. Maybe noticing circulation, digestion, respiration. Maybe even a subtle feeling of tension or holding in the body. Just simply noticing without judgment. And seeing if we can simply bring our attention to whatever physical feeling is most vivid now. Without trying to figure out, repress, suppress, transform, fix. Just see if we can simply learn to be with for a few moments what is really present right now.
And then seeing if we can become aware of whatever emotional feelings are present in the body. Maybe a subtle feeling of anxiety or urgency and need to get a lot of things done. Or a subtle feeling of being a little overwhelmed. Or maybe noticing a feeling of sadness, loneliness, grief. Or even a subtle sense of worry about our own health or the health of another that's dear to us. We might also notice feelings of happiness, contentment, excitement. We might also notice feelings of numbness. And seeing if we can bring our awareness to whatever feeling is most vivid, most salient right now. not trying to unpack or figure out or repress, just really trying to feel whatever is present now with a sense of openness, deep allowing. And if it's a slightly troubled feeling, see if we can be with that feeling in the same way we would a friend or a child or a patient in need, in the same caring, present way we'd show up for another, see if we can extend that same quality of care, openness to our feeling. And if we notice any resistance in this practice, maybe even a slight holding in the body or distraction, see if we can let our attention just be with that feeling of resistance itself. And when you're ready, you can allow that feeling to fade and simply allow your attention to just return to the feeling of the breath as it enters and leaves the body. This is what we call a simple practice of self-care, a simple way of learning to settle into and be with our own emotional life and our own experience. I share this practice often with care professionals and notice a lot of common obstacles to what we call self-care. When I ask people, many of whom are really interested in doing work around self-care, practices of mindfulness, practices of mindfulness of healing like we just explored, they often struggle with, as they say, finding the time or space to do this work. And so when at workshops we ask about some of the common obstacles to care when we survey groups, here's a list of some of the common obstacles we hear. We hear that we're too tired often to take time for self-care, that there's not enough time given our other commitments or our work responsibilities to take time for ourselves. There's not enough time given our responsibilities to our patients, our colleagues, our families to take care of ourselves. There are too many unrealistic expectations placed upon us in our work, or our plates are too full, or we can't really prioritize self-care given that so many other aspects of our lives and our work seem more urgent, or that the practices of self-care don't seem to lend themselves to revealing immediate results. We might not always feel great or more relaxed or more healed after taking time for self-care. And therefore, it might be hard to invest in the short term in actually exploring practices on a regular basis. And I think these all make sense. 
And yet when we ask people to think beyond some of these common obstacles, to dig a little deeper and consider what else might be going on when I say that I don't have time for self-care or when I'm not able to make the time in my day, even for a few moments, to take care of my own inner life, we hear things like this. We hear things like, I'm afraid of taking time for self-care because I'm afraid of exposing my emotions. I'm afraid of revealing, for example, to my colleagues or others how I really feel. I'm afraid that if I sit down or get quiet enough that I'll lose composure, that I won't be able to hold it together, almost as if I've been holding back a dam behind which sit a lot of emotional feelings ready to just flow or pour out. Others express fear of difficult emotions, maybe that we haven't learned growing up in school or in our own professional communities or contexts, ways of relating to, in healthy ways, difficult emotions. Or that we feel that if we were to really let go, we wouldn't actually meet our obligations. For some of us, we might feel like we're the person in our team, in our unit, in our family. That's a sense holding it together. We're the caretaker for all in many ways. And it can feel like a lot or feel even a little bit threatening to begin to let our guard down in that way. This makes a lot of sense. And so the direction of inquiry in a self-care mode is not only to learn how to be with and turn toward our experience, but to recognize these many common obstacles and to be gentle with them the more we learn to host our own feelings, and also the more we learn to recognize some of these common obstacles, the more we can learn to see them in ourselves and see them in others, learn to see others' responses to stress or pressure in a similar light, have a broader sense of acceptance, awareness, and acknowledgement. And also some of the receiving care practices, a way in a sense of creating a field of safety, of receptivity, can also prepare us and support us in doing some of this work that we call deep self-care. The third mode in sustainable compassion training is what we call extending care. And in this mode, what we're learning to do is more deeply see and connect with others beyond our limiting ideas, biases, thoughts, and stereotypes of them. We have a natural capacity for care and compassion. This capacity, however, usually extends only to those in our so-called in-group, to our friends, our colleagues, those that are like us, those that think like us. And we have a more difficult time extending care and compassion to others who are not like us. But I want to emphasize this natural capacity because I think in some ways we've inherited a narrative of selfishness a narrative that somehow we're basically not good enough or that we're fundamentally not good. And therefore, what we need to do is work really hard to train and care and compassion, almost to protect ourselves from our nature. And I think it can be so helpful for those of us in caring professions to recognize this natural capacity, that we have it within us and it's something that can be strengthened. We can learn to recognize this natural capacity in part by exploring that receiving care practice we did, by training ourselves in a sense to notice moments of care and connection that are coming through and pervading our lives, or to simply notice moments of kindness that happen in and through our workplace that may often also go unnoticed, or to reflect on examples of bravery, altruism, and courage throughout history, moments in which others stood up for all other beings. Yet even though we have this natural capacity, as I mentioned, there are a lot of limits to this capacity. It's limited based on those we dislike. It's limited, too, to those often who may have wronged us at some point. And also when we feel stressed out, threatened, or overwhelmed, which might be in many of our experiences in our, in our work days, it can be really difficult to extend ourselves, to extend our care to many others. One of the most pervasive blocks to extending care is what we call in our program, limiting perceptions of others. And what I mean by this is that we have a strong tendency 
to relate to others based solely on our ideas of them. It's almost as if we move through our world and see people as just our ideas of them, as just the patient, just that nurse, that annoying colleague, that person suffering with such and such disease. And it's as if in using those labels, we mistake those labels for the full person rather than seeing or sensing their fuller humanity. And in that way, we reduce them to just our simple ideas and relate to them as if they're separate from, not fully human in some ways. Part of our learning in this mode is learning to scaffold or build off of this natural capacity, learn to recognize the ways in which we see people in limited or limiting ways, and explore learning to see beyond what we call limiting perception. Not seeing others or seeing others in limited ways is not necessarily only a personal habit that we've developed. The ways we see and do not see are often also affected by privilege and positionality. In other words, there are ways that we are conditioned socially, systemically, and structurally to attend to certain people and groups and to see them as more or less important than others. Therefore, part of our own inquiry in developing sustainable compassion and compassionate systems is in both personal, is understanding both personal and systemic causes of bias. For example, understanding the lack of equal access to healthcare or education. As a colleague I work with said, we're not doing compassion if we're not doing equity. In other words, we can build all of the compassion programs we wish and learn to deepen in our own personal capacities for caring compassion. And yet if we're not simultaneously also engaging not only in the personal obstacles to care and compassion, but also the social, systemic, or structural obstacles to compassion, we're in a sense only doing part of the work. So I mentioned earlier, we have a strong tendency to place the burden of healing, of transformation on the individual, as if individuals and not systems were biased or were the problem. We know, however, from work in education that focusing on individual solutions is far from sufficient in transforming the way we see and relate to others. We are embedded in systems and therefore also blind to the conditions that inhibit our capacity for care and compassion unless we explicitly and more consciously become aware of and try to engage them. Without a systemic lens of equity, we can end up in a sense shifting the burden. So I'd like to invite you to think about ways in which this might happen in your own life or your own workplace. I'm going to invite you to think about some of the current work pressures that you or your group find yourself regularly facing. These may be issues of burnout, team cohesion, etc. And as you bring this issue to mind, Think about the ways in which you're currently responding to or coping with these pressures. What are some of the quick fixes that your organization, your unit, your team are currently using to address this problem issue? And now many of us are often aware that some of these quick fixes aren't necessarily addressing some of the underlying problems. So if you had your way and you had the power, what could be done if anything were possible that would fundamentally address the real source or cause of the pressure? In other words, what's the more fundamental source or problem? This, in a sense, is what we're calling a long-term solution. It's, of course, often harder to do, often takes longer, often more difficult to assess 
and map because of the complexity of thinking at a systemic level. But what happens often, even though it's more fundamental, is we apply a quick fix in the short term to address the problem, symptom, or the pressure. And what happens often is a side effect that the quick fixes set us into a loop which makes it even more difficult not only to understand and address the fundamental concern, but to set up strategies, policies, and procedures for the long haul that help us address the longer, un, the long-term solution. Now, I know this is a simple exercise, but part of, and probably pretty simple to understand, and many of us probably think about this in our workplaces, but what we're learning to do is become more conscious of what we could call these system loops or, or breaks in the system in which our own capacity actually to begin to transform on a systemic level is inhibited by simple habits of the way systems perform. There's been a critique in the contemplative movement that it operates primarily on what we call a Trojan horse mentality. And this is, we've seen programs like mindfulness and even compassion programs and other self-care programs being moved into hospitals, clinics, schools, even the military to address issues of stress, burnout, and to promote health and well-being. And while I think overall this movement to address personal causes of suffering is so critical and so important, one of the dangers that a number of colleagues and other scholars have noted is that without also being embraced within and understood within a systemic lens, many of these individual programs that focus primarily on personal transformation not only shift the burden to the individual, as we've mentioned before, putting their own healing on their own shoulders, they also actually sometimes even perpetuate some of the problems of systems, maybe even further perpetuating or reinforcing inequities or helping people in a sense feel more okay with the difficult work, the inequitable work, and the systemic imbalances within the organizations in which we work. So the emphasis here is helping us learn to think not only about tools for personal development, but also beginning to think more systemically, recognizing that our transformation, our health and healing is intimately tied to our personal health and well-being and the overall health and well-being of the systems in which we're embedded. Part of the challenge is actually thinking big in this way. And sometimes when we talk about systems work, it can feel overwhelming, or that there's no possibility for change or transformation, or that it's pointless to think about the system because the system is so big and never will change, and that our only locus of intervention is really primarily the individual. But I'm going to invite us, at the risk of sounding idealistic, to think a little bit bigger. And part of this involves learning to hold, in a sense, a creative tension. So I'd like you to imagine just for a moment what a healthy system would look like, what a healthy organization, a healthy unit that you work in, that you live in, would look like, a vision of the place in which you would actually like to work, a vision of a compassionate system. How would people relate to one another? How would people relate to their work? How would people treat others and expect to be treated? And as you hold that vision in mind for a compassionate system, I'd like you to imagine on a split screen or maybe overlaid on that image, your current reality. Where are you now organizationally? How do people relate to one another, treat one another, expect to be treated?
you might notice a little dissonance or tension between these views, a difficulty of holding both of these in mind, a feeling of distraction from the broader vision and a turning towards or resigning to the current reality or a turning away from the current reality in a sense. And these are all natural responses to what we can call creative tension. And this is a natural habit or challenge that we face when we learn to think systemically. Sometimes the big picture, the big vision seems too far out of reach. Or we hold that vision in mind so much and neglect addressing our current reality. And it's hard for us to bear thinking about the current reality. But in doing so, in holding that vision in mind, and really getting in touch with the current reality within which we're embedded, learning to be with that creative attention, affords us the space to begin to actually make concrete steps toward transforming and realizing that vision for our compassionate system. It's easy in a sense to deconstruct systems I find it's often easy to look at a system, whether it's healthcare or the education system, and point out a number of structural and systemic problems and inequities. And yet if we had the power today to deconstruct the systems within which we're embedded and rebuild them, would we build the most compassionate systems? Or might it be the case that it would be good for us also to be learning to develop our own personal capacities for care and compassion? to continue to explore the ways in which we've internalized our own oppressive systems, unhealthy or unhelpful ways of relating to ourselves and relating to others. Compassion training, in a sense, is a long journey. I mentioned some skills that we can scaffold throughout our lifetime, and we see, as part of sustainable compassion, the process of developing and stabilizing this compassionate stance as a lifelong journey. Requires both the space and support to develop our own personal tools, and also the capacity and resources to develop our own tools for systems thinking so that we can begin to unite and integrate tools for personal and social transformation so that we might all realize more compassionate and sustainable systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavelle. That was really powerful and I, I have to say how challenging it was to really experience a moment of deep self-care and compassion. It's really tough that practice of extending the same quality of care we might offer to others to ourselves. It's a practice that must take a lot of cultivation and time uh, to really become a habit of mind. So we thank you. I think it was very, very helpful. I think um, I I'm wondering if you can give any examples of um, systemic transformation that you're aware of, uh, whether in education or other domains. I, I think we feel that it's important to address both our own individual capacity for compassion, but also to realize that we need to transform our systems to enable the full expression of our compassion, that it's difficult to tend to our own self-care, our own self-compassion uh, if systems of care that we're trying to attend to patients within make it so challenging and, 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 and difficult. So I wonder if, if you could speak to any examples of of systemic transformation that you know of or have been uh, working on? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I feel that some of sometimes when we talk about systemic change, it can feel rather amorphous. I've been working mostly in the last few years in the field of education. And when I entered that field, I came out of a tradition of contemplative practice and various psychological interventions that were focused primarily on individual healing. And we started noticing, like I mentioned here, that what we were doing was only addressing part of the problem. In a sense, we were opening people to their own experience more and more, 
and yet not providing the tools to help them deal with the frustrations of being in a system that felt either dysfunctional or inequitable or worse. And so in some ways, maybe even we're opening people up without the proper training and proper tools. And in the past couple of years, I've been really heartened to learn and to help be part of now um, what we're calling compassionate systems training in schools, in which in addition to training individuals in what we call personal tools for compassion, we've begun to give teams tools for organizing, for developing group cohesion, for mapping as we did some of the common problems that occur within their system and the ways in which as a unit they've been habitually responding to put out fires rather than developing long-term plans for transformation and sustainability. And I know it sounds a little bit simple, but what we found is that, or what we're still finding is that over time, as people learn the tools of systems thinking, learning how to map a system, learning how to recognize common obstacles, there's a parallel here to our personal work, common blocks to fu systems functioning. We've found teams developing, in a sense, more positive work relationships, being more informed about common systems challenges, being able to develop a more of a shared vision, and in that way, being able to, to make longer term plans that weren't just about finding self-care or PD for educators to make them feel better, but as more of a whole school or whole team, really empowering people in a sense to take responsibility and feel a sense of empowerment within their system. And of course, there are issues of power and privilege embedded in there that are I don't want to gloss over too much. But I find that by lifting it up and making conscious what for many people is actually very intuitive, it's just not a language we're often taught, by making that more, more conscious, we can go a really long way in beginning to enact positive school climate as an example and positive compassionate systems. That's really, really important, isn't it? And, and really, just the invitation and the engagement is part of the change process itself. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, I, I think we have several questions from our um, participants. So I'm going to ask Andrea to, um, to offer some of those to you. Great. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you, Beth. Uh, we have a, a number of questions, but before we begin, a reminder to our audience, if you have a question to submit, you may still do so. Just type your question into the questions pane, and we will answer as many as we can in the time remaining. So let's jump into some of our audience questions. Our first question is, what would be a specific example of the shifting the burden model? Great question. Um, in some places, what we find is that there is high rates of burnout, and that's the current problem, the current example. And what we often see is that an organization will spend money on professional development or a staff day to reduce burnout. So we'll see stress management programs, and that one might be a quick fix solution. So maybe it's a day long or an eight week program. And what's not being addressed is what we call these kind of underlying or more fundamental causes is maybe that staff are overworked or there's not team cohesion or there's issues around pay and time off, et cetera. Fundamental organizational principles or even HR policies that are contributing to or exacerbating burnout. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, another question uh, that we've received is, uh, how is uh, the best way to get hospital management and the department, such as the surgery department, to accept this approach um, as being necessary and worth the cost and time necessary to be successful? Great question. I think part of the work for all of us involved in compassion is not only education and training, but also advocacy. And there's a growing body of literature on the effects of compassion training, different various compassion interventions on health and well-being enhancing immune function, empathic accuracy, et cetera. There's been a recent study that came out of the team at Emory, where I used to be, who integrated a compassion training program for medical professionals and found that people exposed to the training were, were experienced less stress and less burnout. And so I think some of that work can help build a case for it um, in a certain sense. And I also think a large part of this is actual experience finding teams within our organizations or institutions to begin to experience this work and speak from that experience and finding ways to make these kinds of programs or interventions 
really relatable to the specific needs of the organizations or teams in which we're embedded. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Great. Well, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, our final question is, do you have any suggestions for people who practice self-care, mindfulness, and sustainable compassion, but work with people who do not, or who are quite resistant to this method of care delivery? That's a great question, too. I think part of... <laughs> I, I, I think the more we learn to deepen in these practices, whether our own self-care or receiving care modes, if that felt relatable to us, the more in a sense we're creating a natural field or an ease or way of being with others, whether they're resistant or not to this work, creating even possibly, I would argue, a field for them to learn to feel just simply more at home around us and near us. And I don't mean in the kind of woo-woo sense, but it's just sense of being easy. And if we kind of in our own hearts or intentions are simply extending that wish of care on a certain level, it, it, we can begin to start to see past some of the resistances, I think, to some of this work on behalf of our colleagues and also understand maybe some, where some of that resistance might come from. Maybe some of the, our own obstacles and blocks to care, our own resistances to letting our guard down, et cetera. And if we can hold that with some kind of understanding some sensitivity that we're kind of all in this together and doing our best, I think we can go a long way to building also an inclusive, compassionate cultures within our organization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, that wraps up our Q&A session for today. Beth, any final thoughts to share with our participants? Uh, well, first, I'd really like to thank Dr. Lavelle for sharing her expertise and her time. And I, I I would really just reemphasize this notion of the need to combine both individually focused and organizational and structural systemic change to really make sustained compassion and collaboration and care a possibility. Uh, and I agree with the need to establish a research base uh, about this, and I think that is actually happening. So again, uh, thank you so much, Brooke, for, for sharing your, your thoughts with us. Um, and I'll turn the program back over to Andrea to close us out. Great. Thank you, Beth. I would again like to thank Dr. Lavelle for sharing her experience and insights with us, as well as everyone in the audience for setting aside time in your busy day to participate. We hope you will join us on October 28th through the 29th at the Harvard Medical School Continuing Education course, Compassion and Practice, Achieving Better Outcomes by Maximizing Communication, Relationships, and Resilience. Learn more about the course and register at theschwartzcenter.org. We hope that you will join us for upcoming programs in the Compassion in Action webinar series, including Conversations That Count, Improving Care for Patients with Serious Illness Through Engagements of Providers and Patients with Dr. Eliza Pippa Schulman on November 22nd. Please visit our website to learn more about the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and our membership program. We know you are busy, but we would very much appreciate your taking a moment to complete the electronic survey upon exiting today's program as we value your input. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs>